Did you know waste plastic is a big problem in the world? We take waste plastic like polyethylene, we put it between two electrodes and flashes, and we generate hydrogen. The Department of Energy had what's called an Earthshot program. They said, we want one kilogram of hydrogen for one dollar in one decade. But I think we've already solved this because we're producing hydrogen for negative dollars. We get paid to make hydrogen. And how can that be? This is one of the first places I'm, I'm out talking about this. So there, this, this is really important. There's only three elements in the periodic table that can be fuel for human beings. Only three elements. One is carbon, which is primarily what we use now, and we're seeing some problems with that, filling our atmosphere with CO2. Another one is hydrogen, you're going to hydrogen fuel, and the third one is plutonium. Those are the only three. The sun is not fuel, it is energy. Fuel you put in a bottle. Energy comes from the sun, uh, energy comes from wind, energy comes from the flow of water. Fuel you can put in a bottle. Uh, hydrogen is a great source of fuel, and there are different ways of getting hydrogen. Right now, hydrogen is made this way. You take methane, and you mix it with steam, and a nickel catalyst is called steam methane reforming, and you get hydrogen out plus CO2. The problem is you make 11 to 12 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen. So when you run on a fuel cell with hydrogen, that hydrogen has already come at the cost of a lot of CO2 being produced. That's the problem with hydrogen today. It's made by steam methane reforming. Well, you can capture that CO2 and try to pump it down whole. That's called blue hydrogen. But you spend a lot compressing that CO2 and finding a place to pump it down whole. If you take renewable energies, and you, you use that renewable energy to electrolyze water, so you turn water into hydrogen and oxygen, you can do that. What is the cost of doing that? We'll see the cost of doing it. It turns out to be quite expensive. But you're, only, you're making less than four kilos of CO2 per kilo of hydrogen, so it's considered, considered a clean source of hydrogen that way, but it's expensive. Black hydrogen is, comes from get coal gasification, pink, is using nuclear energy to electrolyze water. Uh, turquoise hydrogen is the process that I showed you before where you take methane, you strip the hydrogens off, then you use those hydrogens in a fuel cell. It's called turquoise hydrogen. And yellow hydrogen is using solar alone for the electrolysis. White hydrogen is hydrogen that's found in formations underground when you're fracking. It's called white hydrogen. Well, the Department of Energy had what's called an Earthshot program. You've heard of this term moonshot. Now they have Earthshot programs. What can we do for our own planet? They started this Earthshot program in 2021. They said, we want one kilogram of hydrogen for one dollar in one decade. All right, it was called the 111 program. We're not part of this program, but I think we've already solved this because we're producing hydrogen for negative dollars. Negative dollars. We get paid to make hydrogen. And how can that be? Well. If you look at hydrogen, here's the, the growth of hydrogen from 1975 to 2020. Things haven't really changed, but it's about to go up because right now most hydrogen is used for making ammonia, which is our fertilizer, and it's because of ammonia that we can eat. If you look at the, the curve for human population when the Haber-Bosch process came in where you make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, you see this huge uptick in human population when we learned how to fertilize. So it's used for fertilizer, and it's used to hydrogenate fuel oils. You hydrogenate the fuel oils, you get rid of the double bonds, get rid of the aromatics, you put in more thermal content. But it's going to go up dramatically because we're going to start using it in fuel cell vehicles where our only effluent now is water vapor. We're not generating any CO2 in the process. Most, 20 years ago, most of our, our, our uh, hydrogen came from oil. Now most of our hydrogen comes from steam methane reforming, from natural gas, but it's still making 11 to 12 kilograms of hydrogen for every, every uh, uh, kilogram, uh, 11 or 12 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen. So what we do is we take waste plastic. Did you know waste plastic is a big problem in the world? Big problem. We take waste plastic like polyethylene. 
We put it between two electrodes and flash it. We do a slow flash over a period of four seconds, because if you do it fast, you get a lot of unzipping of the polymer. When it hits the ceiling temperature, TC it's called, and unzips back to monomer. This is why polymers are really dangerous in a house fire, for example, because they, they'll hit a certain temperature in that house and the polymers start depolymerizing and blowing, blowing organic vapor into the air and the house explodes. That's why there's an explosion of houses and, and fires sometimes. But anyway, you do a slow flash over about four seconds and we generate hydrogen. Well, how much hydrogen do we generate? Well, what we can do is if we look at polyethylene, here's the hydrogen that we generate. The, 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 um, the, so here's the hydrogen yield, here's the hydrogen efficiency. What you can see here are these big bars from polyethylene. It's mostly H2. We do get some methane coming off, some ethane, some prote propane to butane, but it's mostly hydrogen. Why does H2 form as opposed to CH bonds and methane? Well, the H2 bond, the HH bond, is, is about 14 kilojoules per mole stronger than the carbon hydrogen bond. It's purely thermodynamics. It's, it it, it gain, gains more energy to make a hydrogen hydrogen bond than a carbon hydrogen bond. And so we get mostly hydrogen out of this. Uh, and so what we do is we do what's called an LCA, a, a life cycle assessment. Uh, every one of our papers, we have to have a life cycle assessment now. It's how good really is this? Well, if you look at the cumulative energy demand, here's our flash fuel heating process from polyethylene. It's, it's about the same amount of energy that you would use for green hydrogen. If you look at how much CO2 you generate in the process, it's not that much more than just this green hydrogen from electrolyzing water. It's a lot better than the gray hydrogen where, where you're do, doing now in greenhouse gas emissions. But here's the bottom line. It all gets back to money. If you do green hydrogen electrolysis of water using only renewable sources, wind, solar, it's almost $5 per kilogram of hydrogen. Remember, DOE wants $1 per kilogram. Green hydrogen is $5 per kilogram. Cannot work. Gray hydrogen, which is what is made today, is about $1.50 per kilogram. This is what you're going to have to compete with. You can only be a little bit over this if you've got a, a greener technology, but you've got to be able to compete with this. We are at minus $4.50 per kilogram when we sell our graphene. You sell the graphene, that is what you make your money off of. You are then making hydrogen for negative dollars. And you say, well, that's because you're selling your graphene for $60,000 a ton. No. I took that number of $60,000 a ton and divided it by 20 brought it down to $3,000 a ton, projecting it to where it would be if it were a bulk plastic, around $3,000 per ton. At $3,000 per ton of graphene, we'd still be making $4.50. We would be making $4.50 to, to make hydrogen. This is a way to take carbon materials in waste plastic, in waste. It's not just waste plastic, it's household waste. We've got a whole program off of household waste. The vast majority of what you and I throw out is carbon. If it's not glass and it's not metal, it's carbon. And, and all, this has a lot of hydrogen with it. You get the hydrogen off as H2, you take the carbon, you turn it into graphene, you put that into your building materials, never enter the CO2 cycle again. It is a great show for humanity. Uh, this is where this is going. So um, we're flashing many things. So this is a mountain. These are big, big hills of Fly ash. Fly ash is the residue that's left over after burning coal. You burn coal and you get this residue that's left over. It's the inorganics that are left after burning coal. And it's mostly uh, silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, some iron oxide. And there's a lot of rare earth elements in that. Rare earth elements are these precious elements, but they're not, they're not formally precious elements. They're these valuable elements at the bottom of the periodic table. We need those. Badly, we need those. And uh, uh, they're in every one of your smartphones, every one of your computers. And China now controls the market. U.S. used to have a big market in this, but we shut down our mines 15 or 20 years ago because a lot of radioactive materials were coming up with it and the separations were too much trouble. In China, they have no problem. They just pump the, the radioactive material back down hole. We're not allowed to do that. When the U.S. got out of the business, the Chinese raised the price tenfold on rare earth elements. So now it's become a national security concern. Turns out, Coal has rare earth elements in it, but it's very dilute. Now you burn away the coal, 
you're left with the rare earth elements and these other metals. But now it's encased in a silicon aluminate, uh, aluminosilicate glass. So it's very hard to get at this. We flash it, it breaks the glass because of that fast heating, fast cooling, <clears throat> and then we just wash it out with 0.1 molar HCl to get the rare earth elements. That's coming in NUCO number one. NUCO number two is we take printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards are a toxic waste. Every time you save something to the cloud, it's not in a cloud. It's going onto a printed circuit board somewhere in a server farm. Those printed circuit boards are replaced every three years. Lots of precious metals there, lots of toxic metals. We flash it, we get out all the precious metals come out, all the toxic metals. What we have left after flashing, it goes from a toxic waste to something that's clean enough to be agricultural soil in the state of California. That's how clean it gets. Uh, we, are, we are flashing, we already published on flashing the battery anodes to revive them, and now battery cathodes, that paper has been submitted. That'd be another company. And then flashing soil, soil remediation. We can get out all the heavy metals, we get out all the, the, the uh, organics carbonized, and, and we get out the PFAS as well. So this is, this is the process that's going through. With that, let me just say that this work was funded predominantly now by the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Air Force and the Department of Energy. And here's the folks that do the work. And uh, um, with that, I'll end it and take questions. Thank you. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I have filed one disclosure per month for the last 25 years. Okay, one disclosure a month. So think of how many, how many uh, uh, office actions I'm working on at the same time. I have, I have one that I was working on on the airplane, just coming over here, and I'll be working on the airplane going back. I file a lot of patents. A lot of times these disclosures will be combined as we fly, file several provisionals and bunch them together. Um, so we have patent protection. It's up to the companies to protect it. Once they license it, they are obliged to now have to go, go out and protect it. And uh, um, when in other countries, we will file in other countries. We file in China, but in China, things are opaque. We don't even bother filing in India because they, they don't protect things anyway. We don't bother filing in Russia because if you go to Russia to defend it, you'll die before you get to the courthouse. Uh, so there's just some locales you just don't even bother with. And, and, uh, but most of the market is, is going to be uh, 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 the U.S., the EU, we of course file in, and, and a couple of countries in Asia. We file in China. Uh, we've gotten some patents to go through in China. Uh, usually you have to have a corporate partner in China, and then all of a sudden the patent gets accepted. So there, there are mechanisms. Okay, so, so the, the size of the sample and uniform heating. So that's a lot of what the company has worked out. We've only flashed up to about 10 grams at a time in my own lab. And uh, 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 you have to put in, the larger the sample, the higher the voltage, the higher the current. So you're not doing a flash of one ton at a time. You do a flash of a certain number of, say, kilos at a time. But it's, I want you to, to, I can't talk about what the company does. Let me talk about what I have in my own mind, okay? It's like, it's like the block of a car. You have lots of, 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 of uh, piston chambers. Piston pumps, squeezes in the material. The piston is one of the electrodes. Boom, flash and push it back out. So you do lots of smaller flashes and lots of them going, boom, 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 and dumping out kilos at a time. So you, you keep the flash to a manageable level according to the amount of electricity that you can bring in. Uh, you, don't, you can run it DC, you can run it AC. If you bring in enough power, you don't have to run it DC. And uh, uh, the, the, the other thing about the, the efficiency of the flashing it's actually the middle of the sample is the hottest because it's the furthest away from the electrodes, which are the massive faces of the cooling. So actually, the, the middle of the sample is the hottest. We use quartz tubes that we flash in with, with, with uh, uh, graphite electrodes. Um, but in, in the company, they have, you know, they're running on a totally different scale, totally different materials. And so, so um, but that, that's how you do it. But, Always with dual heating. If, if you just take a wire and, and put, put a high voltage across it, that wire is going to break. Where does it break? It always breaks right in the middle. 
breaks furthest away from the electrode. So, so getting heat to the middle is not generally a problem. Why doesn't it just burn up? It's the same thing that happens with the laser-induced graphene where we use the laser in the air. There's enough outgassing that it's self-protected. So, for example, if we start with metallurgical coke, which is a coal product that's been heated, or calcined uh, uh, petroleum coke, which is another petroleum product which comes out the, the bottom of these, these things where there's no more distillation, then they take it and then they heat that in air. Uh, 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 it's already been cooked. So you get a lot of the volatiles off, but there's, there's still only about 90% carbon. So if we start with, if you start with a kilo of metallurgical coke, we can end up with 900 grams, 90% yield of graphene. The other 10% has come out because, because that will be hydrogen atoms, that'll be oxygen atoms, and a little bit of, of other gases. So, so what happens is, those gases come out and they're moving out and that's called outgassing, so it's protecting the material inside from getting burned up. It's a very convenient way. Yeah, so, so you know, I'm an organic chemist and I probably am more sensitive about putting chemicals into my body than anybody else because I'm an organic chemist. And I know that our bodies are extremely well-balanced ecosystems and anything you do any, any medication you take, for example, to solve something is reacting somewhere else as well. And that's not to say that I'm against medications. I mean, you gotta take medications or you die, okay? So you, you know, everything is a, is a balance here. But what I'm saying is I don't take them willy-nilly. Uh, so I'm careful about it. So you, you're not putting graphene in uh, uh, indiscriminately. But if it's in a bone composite, it's fine. Many people have used it, used graphene oxide as drug delivery vehicles. We use, in this company, uh, uh, Gernox, we're using a, a small oxidized pieces of, of graphene that, that, that come from, from uh, uh, coconut husk. Uh, we're using that, and they seem to be non-toxic. They seem to be non-toxic. They clear in about two hours, so we have about a two-hour half-life, and we had to increase in the bloodstream. We had to put on peg, peg groups to increase it to two hours. The graphene oxide just came out very, very quickly. I'm talking within, within 10 minutes, you're down to like 50% of it. So as long as the particles are small, they go through the kidneys and out the urine if they're below about 70 nanometers. If they're above 70 nanometers, our bodies have mechanisms to get rid of it too. It goes into the liver, through the bile duct, into the, the intestines, and out the feces. Um, it doesn't seem to be. So a lot of tests have been done with the inhalation of carbon nanotubes. Single wall nanotubes, it's not a problem because macrophages can wrap it up. The long, stiff, multi-wall nanotubes, those, those are like asbestos because when it gets into your lungs, your body tries to clear it out and you have macrophages that gobble these things up and they take it and they bring it up and you end up coughing it out. What happens with long nanotubes is they're longer than the macrophages themselves, so they're sticking out the ends. It's just what happens with asbestos, and, it, and, and so it's a dangerous material. People have studied graphene, and it seems to not be a problem, and that's probably because it's so supple. These can be wrapped up, and then you end up coughing it out. So it seems to be a lot less trouble, but we take real care about this, and it depends on what your, if your source is metallurgical coke and you flash it, it's not a volatile, it's not a, it's not a very fluffy material that comes out. If you flash carbon black, like, like 20 nanometer carbon black, now you're left with a material that, that's a lot more puffy. You open up the container, it's just kind of floating in the air. So we take more precautions with that. But we, in our lab, we treat everything as dangerous. It's not like, oh, this is a nanomaterial, we gotta be dangerous. If you're an organic chemist, everything is dangerous. Everything. And, and, uh, and, that, and that's just the way you treat it. Uh, and you wear safety glasses, you wear PPE, you only work in the hood. So for us, it's not a problem. Before it would ever get in industry, they'll test this a lot better and they'll see what kind of precautions they have to take as they scale it up. It, it appears that microbes cannot easily oxidize it. Now, I guarantee you, you could find, you could engineer microbes to oxidize this. There will be environments where you could, you could do this, but it's, it's slow to oxidize. And it's, it's an amazing thing. Just think about it. You don't have to slow it down forever. If you just slow this thing down for 100 years, that's it. You're done. 
Because in 100 years, we'll have other energy sources where we're not going to be, we're not going to care about CO2 anymore. CO2 is not going to be our problem. We'll have other problems in 100 years. So you, only, you, don't, you don't have to slow this thing down eternally. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.